is a time trial dungeon. So those teams know exactly uh, what they're supposed to do because they practice it to qualify for this tournament. Yeah, and absolutely. On top of that, both of these two teams were on the top four of the dungeon. Only 25 seconds apart in their time, so both of these teams know exactly what they're doing. Now, we did see two completely different strats yesterday. We saw two different teams doing two different strategies. One of the teams pulled Rezan first, one of the teams went up to Volkal first. So it'll be inter interesting to see which of the two Poluka does, or they might do a completely different strat. Yeah, we saw uh, one team, 40k, actually pulled those uh, Colossuses over and actually killed them, uh, which actually turned out like they won the whole map against, I believe it was Abracadabra. So uh, they had a good strategy here, but we see both of those teams uh, running back after this strat, even though Team Poluka actually has some trouble with, here with this. Yeah, the Rogue dropping very low there, even proccing his cheat death at 4%. Once again, this pull isn't too dangerous because the healers are standing on top of the pillar to bait all of the juggernaut charges, and then the rogues, can, rogues and the elemental shaman on the side of Team Poluka can lock down all of the dangerous cast times. Yeah, so uh, on a nice, uh, Method and Ace side here, they already moved forward to the Sky Screamers and those uh, small raptors here to jump around that are pretty dangerous because it is a fortified setting, of course, and we have Raging, so once the mobs are really low, it does do a lot of damage when they jump around. And it's also important to mention the other affix because when you're doing these time trial dungeons, you really need to make sure you're pulling as much as possible, but one of the biggest limiters on that is the, is the explosive affix. You pull too many mobs, you'll get too many explosives, and it's really hard to deal with, you know, four or five plus explosives because they'll explode and kill your team pretty easily. Yeah, of course. So uh, one thing to mention about the rogues, of course, is that they are really good at killing the explosives, not only because they're doing so much damage to them and killing them easily, but uh, one more thing to note is that they're cleaving off of the explosives. Now, some other classes, they can kill them very easily too, but uh, while they use their global to kill the explosive, they're not doing damage to anything else. While the rogues can kill the explosives, and because of their blade floor, they will cleave off the, of the explosives and not lose any damage on the trash. So it looks like Method and A is doing the exact same strategy they pulled off yesterday. They went down and pulled the two sky skyscrapers on the left side of the dungeon, as did Team Poluka. So pretty much exact same strats coming out of the dungeon. Now, on the side of Method and A, we see this important strategy where they use their blind on both of the honor guards so they don't get any of that massive AoE group damage. All they have to worry about is dealing with the two hexers that they only have to interrupt and the shield bearers that they need to stun when that dome, dome goes down, causing everything to take reduced damage. Yeah, and of course, uh, with the triple melee setup, you have so many interrupts to deal with those hexers, with those casters and of course they also have a lot of single target stuns to just remove those bubbles that reduce the damage taken which instantly comes out as we see here. And we see Poluka actually pulling one of the honor guards. Now I think this is probably a little bit more dangerous to do but it does give more mob count so we'll have to see what the difference is in terms of time here. It looks like Method and A is definitely ready to move on though after their smaller much safer pull. Yeah, so they're th um, 39 percent they just uh, short of the second reaping wave to spawn. They are using their shroud here. Uh, they're either going to the bus or pulling a trash pack, uh, and we see they're actually going to the bus. Yeah, once again, going into the Volcal vol room, the mechanics of this boss, it's a two-phase fight. There are three totems in each corner of the room. You need to kill all three of those totems at the exact same time. At the same time, the boss will leap towards players and start casting an ability that you need to interrupt. Otherwise, it'll start putting a debuff on all players in the group. Yeah, so phase one, uh, the damage uh, is important on the totems, but of course uh, the boss is not actually damageable, so you want to make sure that all the totems die at the same time as fast as possible. And one thing to note here that they also spawn explosives, right? And as we mentioned, they j there's just no range DPS uh, on uh, Method and A side to deal with the explosives, so they need to make sure that on each totem there's one DPS at least to make sure they can kill those explosives and not have any of them go off. And we see Method and A quickly entering phase two just as Team Poluka starts pulling the boss in phase one, with the main difference being that Team Poluka did pass their 40% raging mark, so they dealt with that second ra wave of raging, or reaping rather, sorry. Volcal in the second phase starts exploding all over the place, similar to what the honor guards do outside, and you can see here, you don't really want to deal with the honor guards, especially if they're going to impact just like this boss does. Yeah, so uh, on Team Poluka's side, we do have one death. Now, this was intentional because they had to uh, shroud or death skip to uh, the boss. Now, of course, uh, the, uh, Frusha can't be an adult, so he had to die and they had to rest him back up, which, again, uh, we just we mentioned this a lot, but the fact that j the shaman just can't be an adult is costing him uh, w five seconds here, five seconds there, rest timer here, rest timer there, and in the end, it will just add up and it will be a disadvantage. We see Volkal just about to go down for Method and A right after this boss lies. I believe they're planning on using their second shroud to get to the next pole in the dungeon where they'll be dealing with, once again, two hexers and two shield bears, in addition to two brand new mobs, the uh, little ninjas.
<laughs> yeah, so we have the, the stalkers, I believe, are they, they are called. So they are stealth. They patrol in a certain direction around. Um, usually, when you have a demon hunter, they can actually use their spectral side to see where they are. But uh, they probably know exactly uh, where they are because they will reach the same point of the dungeon uh, at the same time always, right, since they're practicing. So they know, uh, so we practice this dungeon a lot. If we're uh, reaching this moment at, let's say, five minutes into the into the dungeon, then the stalkers will be exactly in this position, right? So they know where the stalkers are. Uh, we saw Nerf jump in there, pick them up immediately, and uh, drag them into the next pack. Also, really important to note there that they do use the Ring of Peace the second all six of these mobs get into their raging affix. It's just really strong mob control. Make, sh make sure their tank doesn't get hit by anything. The biggest thing to watch out for is that these shield bearers also have a mechanic called shield bash, which if you kite them around too much, they tend to shield bash their closest targets. So if you have a melee that's too close to them, they can't instigate your melee. Method and I also moving forward quickly pulling two packs of swords with two skyscrapers, making sure they're being efficient pulling two packs together. These swords are incredibly dangerous, however, especially on this explosive affix and with raging. Yeah, we see Yoda actually going down here with all those explosives and the stalkers is jumping around on uh, with this raging affix. Uh, we do see the Belras coming out of JB, so Yoda is back alive and they managed to recover this pull, but the dangerous pull coming in here from Method and A. Yeah, it looks like they're getting through it relatively cleanly. I mean, you kind of have that battle res as a savior just in case you mess up. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's probably the best case scenario for them. One death on that pack is pretty, is pretty safe because, I mean, you have to deal with 10 mobs jumping around doing massive AoE group damage if you're too stacked. And on top of that, while they're jumping around, they have a chance to spawn explosives away from the group. So one death, I mean, it's a lot better than wiping for sure. And we see them moving on to Rezon here. Yeah, so they proc their weeping wave on top and then they jump down to uh, engage Rezon. And they also get, of course, the reaping wave coming down towards them. So they're not wasting any time on this reaping wave. They're just going to cleave it down while fatty. Rezan. Now, Rezan is a very straightforward boss and not very dangerous except uh, on tank damage. Now, uh, once in a while, he will fixate one player uh, and will pretty much walk towards this player. If he reaches the player, he will eat him and do a lot of damage, as we actually can see right here. So, Nerf didn't walk far enough and he actually got eaten, and we see him getting a lot of damage. Yeah, fortunately, he is a warrior tank, so we can deal with that pretty <laughs> easily. Now, one of the things to mention is that you can cast abilities while you're eaten, as long as they don't require you to be facing your target. So he can use cooldowns as well, and while you're in there. It, it wasn't too dangerous. It did require a lot of healing, although that wasn't necessarily an ideal situation for them. Yeah, I think the problem was uh, there that he wanted to pick up the reaping mobs, and sometimes the range of the boss actually reaching you is further than you think it is. So sometimes you might think, oh, I'm safe here, but then he just picks you up and you're not actually safe. Yeah, we just... see both uh, Team Paluka and uh, Method and A uh, are pretty much playing the same route, except Team Paluka played a little bit more like these honor guards, like you mentioned before. So they do have 5% more trash percentage here, but they're playing uh, the same route, so they're both on Rasan right now. Of course, Team Paluka being a little bit behind on boss damage because they do have this 5% trash more than they did. Now, usually what these teams will do when they get to this boss is they'll use their shadow melds in order to cancel off any fixates, so it's surprising that they even had a fixate go off there. Yeah. We, see, we do see a fixate going off here. Instant, well, went on the tank again, unfortunately. I th don't think he has a shadow melt up available for that. So, once again, the boss is going to chase the tank again, and everyone's going to have to shuffle across the room with the dinosaur, which is actually pretty unfortunate because they're going away from the direction they need to go. They need to go in the other direction in the dungeon to move on to the rest of the poles. Yeah, these small things uh, we talked, uh, you talked about earlier, actually, about Method U. So with Method U, they kind of just had all these small little things with movement to just save them so much time if you add it up together. Now, we see Method and A here. They ended up the boss fight to be in the wrong side. So now they did have to mount up and walk the way back. Now, this is only going to be two or three seconds, but this is a race, right? And the, every single second counts. And we did see the same thing happen to Team Poluka as well. They are in that same back, back yeah. corner because it went on the Ellie Shaman, who, as we've mentioned many times, cannot be a Night Elf, so cannot Shadow Meld, doesn't have any way of dropping that combat. Method and Aish using a shroud to get another double sword pack pull here, and they're also pulling in both Skyscreamers. So there are three Skyscreamers in this pull, meaning three mobs that need to be interrupted. If those interrupts do go off, the entire group will be feared, meaning they're probably going to die. That would be a disaster if one of those fears go off. Now, we mentioned before that uh, Triple Melee Edge is very good at interrupting, so as long as they assign uh, one player for each Skyscreamer, they should be all right. But this pull was just very scary in general because of all these swords that they're jumping around, especially with Raging. So what Method and A did was they finished off the swords, the small mobs, and they want the Skyscreamers, of course, have more HP, uh, and they just pulled them into the next pack. 
Yep, and it looks like they pulled them in the next pack. They don't really need any interrupts for the next pack, except for one or two interrupts on the augers. Once the, once the augers are interrupted, they don't cast for another 30 seconds or so, they, so they don't really require too much attention. It's just all about making sure you deal with the important mobs first, and make sure you focus your DPS on those, and once those are dead, you can kind of just relax for the rest of the pack and then move on further in the dungeon. Yeah, so they're reaching the point uh, of this room with the priestess, right? This is the, the one room where the most difficult pull probably out of this whole dungeon starts and where the last time we saw Method and A doing this pull, they actually wipe. So we'll see if they try to do the same pull with their bloodlust being ready or if they try to do something safer, maybe. Yeah, the most dangerous moment of this pull is going to happen right after they initiate the pull. JB's going to move to the back of the room so that he can bait the Juggernaut charges. We see him moving towards it right, he's going to start doing it right about now. And while he's doing that, the tank is he's moving over there right now. And the tank isn't getting that many heals when he's moving. So this is the most dangerous part of the dungeon right now. And it looks like they're doing it pretty clean this time. No explosives going off that wiped them last time. They're just AOing everything down perfectly right now. I think this time around they did it a little bit different because the last time I saw uh, Method and I doing this pull, JB walked to this uh, Juggernaut safe spot immediately. Now, if you're on the safe spot, there's one problem, right? You can't, you're, you might be out of range from the people that are standing there. That's why they pull them so close to this ledge, to the stairs. But uh, Nerf was pulling them up and he was running out of range of JB while he was already standing on this spot, not managing to pre-hot the tank. So even, uh, we did have an explosive go through and that's what killed him but maybe if he had some hots on him beforehand and maybe he, if he had some healing then maybe he wouldn't have died so we saw jb uh, holding off and running to that safe spot just to make sure that nerf is the right him well you know what they say lightning never strikes twice and fortunately they don't wipe here again moving on to priestess alunza another cyclical boss encounter like we've seen so many times in this dungeon Every, every, whenever the boss gets to 100 energy, she will target all of the players in the group with a, with a spell called Transfusion. Now, she also spawns five blood puddles around the room, one for each player. If the player does have a blood puddle, it, would it will cause the boss to deal damage to herself when she casts Transfusion. If the player has not picked up a blood puddle, she will heal herself. Now, because of this mechanic, the boss tends to die pretty quickly because the transfusion cast does a lot of damage to the boss. Yeah, we also see those ads spawning in the background that are being rooted and blinded and succeed in any way because those ads, they will try to walk towards those pools and actually remove them if they reach them. So they will just be succeed and ignore pretty much. Now, uh, one thing to mention on Team Paluka's side, they did not use their bloodlust for this very big pool that both teams did. And they, at the same time, they also triggered the 100% reaping already and killed it on top of Priestess. Now, even though it looks like Team Paluka is a little bit behind, but this priest is going to die very soon because of the transfusion, and then they will reach the last boss with their blood us ready and not having to kill any more mobs. Yeah, the important thing about the transfusion buff is it does about 25% of the boss's HP, so they still have about 10% to do to the boss while Method A is moving onwards. Now, Method A, like you said, they still have to proc their fifth reaping wave, and it's going to be interesting to see whether they do that right now, which they appear to be doing right now. In the pro what they're planning on doing is shadow melding that trash before they move on to the final boss. I think those swords actually don't give enough percentage, so they need to cool. Oh, actually, okay, so it did give enough percentage. They will go onwards, and as you said, probably shed them out the way, and those things, or even if they don't shed them out, they could just kill it on top of the boss, because they do have a lot of passive AoE. But yeah, once again, Team Paluka down the boss now. They're on their way to the last boss. They still have to trigger the event, though, and it, it takes a while until the stairs open, you can actually walk up to the boss, while Method and A already engaged Yasma. So all of the difference right now is just time-based, right? Method the Dene pulled the boss probably about 20 to 25 seconds earlier. However, Team Poluka still has the Bloodlust available for this boss. Now, and the side of Method Day is a fortified dungeon, so that Bloodlust isn't necessarily as important to take down the tyrannical boss, but this is still going to be incredibly close and down to the wire. The only other difference is going to be the difference that a monk can do on single target versus what an Ellie Shaman can do. Yeah, so I think, uh, to be honest, an Elemental Shaman, we've seen, it, we've seen before that they're so good on single target damage if they have this Bloodlust. As we can see here, on the opener, almost speaking to 60k DPS because of just those big cooldowns and the Bloodlust coming in. Now, of course, on the other side, the monk is doing a little bit less single target damage, but he's also buffing the damage of everyone else. And we see, of course, also the rest of the is trying to do as much damage as possible. This is so close. Yeah, when we pulled this boss, Method and A had the boss at 70%, so there was a 30% gap. With that Bloodlust, they've already closed that gap to 20%, and they're still gaining, but their Bloodlust is about to run out, so Method and A should keep this 20% lead throughout the rest of the fight. Yeah, so we see the Bloodlust is still going on. Now, Shaqib dropped really low, but... but 
of course, Zest had three deaths, so he didn't go down. Now, both of those teams also have one death, so there's no, there's no time difference at all. So depending on just who does more damage, we'll win here. I mean, any, any one death at this point can make it. If Method and A dies, that's enough for Team Fuluka yes. to catch up and kill this boss. So Method and A, all they need to do is keep it clean, make sure they deal with the ads, don't get hit by any spiders, and just kill the boss. Yeah, so 15%, the, the boss is dying really fast here for Method and A, so I don't think Team Faluka can ca catch up at this point. One problem as well for the Elemental Shaman, there's just a lot of movement on the spide, right? For a melee, it doesn't matter because he can keep sticking to the boss, but the Elemental Shaman has to move sometimes from those spiders just chasing and losing damage. They're going completely and there we go. all in here. They know how close it is. They ring a piece of those ads away, don't spend any time dealing with the ads, and they clean it out very well. Impressive win for Method and A there. Method NA getting their little bit of their stride, a little bit of their swagger back here on Atal Dazar, making sure they seal that victory and really show us how they performed in those time trials there, Sowers. Yeah, it was really was a rem remarkably close dungeon where there was a couple points in time where Method NA could have potentially lost the lead or even thrown the dungeon away, but they, was, they were able to execute it very cleanly this time. They didn't have any issues at all with explosive or anything else, and that's why they were able to, to steal this victory, I guess. Yeah, and you're even able to see some of the corrections that they had to make and the aggressive pulls getting the job done, being able to actually hop down and even recovering here from this very scary moment where you were seeing Nerf getting devoured. We've seen a number of times whenever the tank is targeted by that fixate, the tank will kind of like lurch for, or the boss will kind of lurch forward a little bit onto the tank and require the monk or the druid to have that off taunt to be able to slow it down a little bit. Yeah, so the boss will just kind of like rush down a tank at the very end of its fixate. Well, it doesn't do that for any other role, but they were fine. They were able to recover that very nicely. They didn't have any issues there or a lesser tank or lesser healer might have accidentally let the tank die, which they didn't have a battle res at the time, so if the tank did end up falling there, that could have cost them the dungeon. And there have been multiple different times where Method NA has fallen to so some critical errors, mistakes there, and just very light on battle res is there, uh, as you mentioned before. But talking about the clip, what was the big highlight that you have for this dungeon here, Sowers? The dungeon was just, it was clean overall. They, they didn't make any of the mistakes that they did the previous time in the dungeon. And they, they cleaned up their pool before the first boss really well, or I believe the last time they pulled some of the trash on the side, which was what spawned the explosive orb that ended up killing them. But this time in Ataldazar, they didn't pull a mob from the two pack in the side, and they instead ki got their kill count off of the Sarids in the patrol in the middle to get kill count. So that small uh, change in how they did the dungeon was what allowed them to have such a clean run. Yeah, and we were even seeing, I know, looking at those time trials, how they're able to adjust to it, seal that final percentage, and like you mentioned, that middle mob, you're actually able to take down those Sarids without pulling the rest of the pack in there. But when we're moving on into Underrod here, this is another dungeon that we've seen the numerous times and has been featured in on that time trial. Zaronic, we've also seen both teams be featured in there as well. What are you thinking about this matchup so far? I'm thinking the biggest thing about this Underrod is that Shakib is very, very good at Unholy DK, and they're probably going to bring the Unholy DK out in this dungeon. I'm not, I don't remember well, we haven't actually seen Underrot from Team Poluka. That's right. So we're not really sure if they're going to bring out the Unholy DK. They've opted to play double Rogue Ellie Shaman the entire tournament, not really using the Unholy DK. And I think not having that option in Underrot is going to hurt them. They did play Moonkin once. That's right. You think it, <laughs> are, are you thinking that we're going to have another Moonkin again here, Negro? I very highly doubt that. <laughs> well, let's find out on the other side of this break. Don't go anywhere, guys. Method NA up 1-0 versus Team Poluka.
Welcome back to the Mythic Dungeon International here. Game one has been decided between Method NA and Team Pualuka here. Now we're going to be moving on to the Underrod here. This entire series is going to feature maps that were featured in the time trials here. So they're dungeons each of the teams should know and be very well practiced on. It's ironic. We've seen these before. And as you mentioned, we haven't seen Pualuka on this one in the tournament just yet. Are we seeing any kind of comp swap swaps or anything like that going to come up for them, or are they just sticking to their same old? Honestly, I doubt it. Like Nagura mentioned earlier, they did play the, the Boomkin in the Temple of Sethralis that one time, but they've pretty much stuck to this double rogue Ellie Shaman comp throughout the entire tournament. I think they're kind of stuck to it. Yeah, and at this point, I don't think comp swapping has been super heavy for them, but I do wonder if it might have hurt them somewhere in this tournament here. Nagura, we haven't seen too much in the way of full Shadow Meld skips in a dungeon like Underrot because you're able to pair it with so many bosses going into it. Yeah, so in Underrot, it might not be coming to a super disadvantage to not have this Shadow Melt for them, at least on this one player. But the fact that you don't have the, this Unholy DK, and we've seen pretty much all the teams with the uh, best times, they were playing this Unholy, were playing this strategy where they pull the Reaping on top of the boss, so that might cause them to just not have it. Let's not, talk about, let's not talk about what they don't have, but what they do have here. With that Earth <laughs> Elemental here, Sours, we should be expecting even more aggression out of them because they basically have a, another tank for a full minute. Yeah, er Elemental Shamans are a lot like Boomkins. They fill very much the same role in a dungeon, and Earth Elemental, while it's a little bit worse than the trees from a Boomkin, uh, they, they do similar things. But, uh, like the Earth uh, the Shaman AoE is pretty remarkable. How many targets do you need on AoE to cast Starfall, Nagura? I know it's... Oh, I don't know if we should... Uh, <laughs> seven. Seven oh. targets. So unless you can be pulling seven targets always for the Boomkin, the, the, you might just be loose into tanks. And we, we see that... Shakib is, is right switching onto the Unholy Death, and we have seen him play it quite a bit here, where Team Puluka is running the same comp they've run this whole time. Yep, and taking care of that Unholy DK, getting quite popular for them on this very high trash density dungeon runs. Be expecting a lot of the larger skeleton pulls coming into this, but Team Puluka needs this game to stay in the series, or Method NA will shut them out here. Game two on the Underrod. Welcome back, Nagura. We're going to see Method and A Underrod again. I love watching them run this dungeon. Um, I don't think I've cast it the last time they did this dungeon, so I'm not completely sure uh, what strat they're running, but I assume it's the same as we've seen from other teams with uh, the DK, right? Yeah, they definitely do a lot of emphasis on making sure they pull reaping packs into bosses, into other packs. They're incredibly good at it. They've been doing it since practice runs before time trials. The thing about Team Poluka is we haven't really seen them do much, and we, d we know that they don't have the Unholy DK to benefit from the exponential AoE, so it's going to be interesting to see how they do the pulls. Yeah, maybe they have some different routes plant that is playing around this Elemental Shaman of theirs. Uh, maybe they even uh, pull something completely different. We will see. But we do have, uh, of course, different aspects here. We have Tyrannical, Sanguine, Volcanic, and Reaping, of course. Now, Tyrannical means that the boss fight just take a long time. So, of course, single target does matter. And uh, even though Unholy DK, single target damage is not that great, but the more, if you can pull the Reaping on top of it, then they can catch up a little bit uh, on the single target damage because of this faster mind, right? And once again, we see Method and A doing a, a pull where they're CCing the mobs that they don't want to deal with, and they're going to Shadow Meld them later on in the dungeon. Lighty going down really low, 10% there, but it looks like he's safe here. Yoda also dropping pretty low, but it looks like they're... Ooh, Yoda hasn't boxed his cheat death yet. He's probably fine. Now they're dealing with this AoE packet that's incredibly dangerous because they have this chosen blood matron here. Yeah, we see Team Paluka's rogue also dropping really low. I think the rogue's just the dealing with those uh, trash mechanics or getting targeted by the trash mechanic a lot because we do have this barb shot of course and the net that do a lot of damage on top of just having the matron buff everyone now team paluka is on the first boss now they do have the blood us ready uh, they might choose to not use it and save it for a later pull but once again we see we're gonna see right here where this unholy dk comes into play reaping coming into the boss with bloodlust you're about to see a dk do a lot of damage for the first 20 seconds of this boss yeah, so uh, we talked about Faster Mind now. That's the a talent that pretty much uh, whenever you have your wounds on all those mobs and you pop them, then depending on how many targets you hit, you will get strength and you will stack up. There's a cap to it. The, there used to be not a cap at all, but now there's a cap at 20. So if you do have the traits for it, you will get approximately 6,000 strength. And even though Team Puluka pulled the boss probably 5 to 10 seconds before Method Dene, Method Dene has already caught up and passed them with the power of that Unholy DK on single target. Nerf dropping incredibly low there, but it looks like he's going to be fine. Well, Nerf uh, actually got hit by one of those abilities from the bosses. Uh, when they jump to a player and cast this uh, red circle around them, 
you have to go go away because if you get hit by it, it actually does a lot of damage. But Nerf is a tank, so he did manage to survive, thankfully. The main mechanic of this boss is, of course, the Blood Bolt cast that you need to enter up. Now, one of the strengths of Prot Warriors is they have uh, spell... Uh, spell sh what's, what's the name of the ability? My, my brain spell is... Spell Reflect? Uh, spell Reflect, thank you. <laughs> really easy name. Forgot it. Spell Reflect. They can reflect the Blood Bolt back to the boss and do more damage. On the side of Team Paluka, we see a full oh, team no. wipe on the first boss. This is... Very oh God. unfortunate. So the boss is very low already, but they had the second, uh, the second mirror image spawn. Now, uh, as you said, the Blood Bolt, very uh, important ability from this boss. That if you do not interrupt this ability, it will do an uh, incredible amount of damage to their aggro target. So uh, if it is the tank, then he can spell reflect the at um, Blood Bolt and do a significant amount of damage to it. But if the tank doesn't pick up aggro immediately from this ad and uh, it goes through to someone else, then they will die, of course. So I believe there was some interrupts just not going through or the tank thinking he could spell reflect or not actually having aggro. Yeah, that's pretty unfortunate. That might have been the same thing that had Nerf go low earlier. It's, it's going to be important to see what Team Polukan can do now, because we saw the same thing happen to the team that played Method NA last time around. Team 40k had a problem right before the first boss, and they weren't able to get back because they had used all of their skips at that point. Method NA moving on to Kragma's room, on, on the other hand. And we've seen how they pull this room before. They do two big pulls where they do both halves of the room which is incredibly dangerous considering the mechanics of the mobs in this room. Yeah, so there's a couple of difficult uh, mechanics to deal with with those mobs, especially those Blood Swarmers that we see here on the right side. Now, the Blood Swarmers do fixate on a random target and they will try to attack them. They are uh, slow, so you can walk away from them, but if you walk too far, they will actually rush on top of you and melee hit you for a lot of damage. Uh, on top of that, we, of course, have these uh, Living Rods, which aren't too dangerous because all they do is pretty much hit the tank, walk really slowly and cast those green pools that they need to walk out of. But uh, there's a lot of more a lot more dangerous maps that we can see being pulled here. And we can see that even pulling two Pharaoh Blood Swarmers at the same time is incredibly dangerous because if one person gets fixated by both Blood Swarmers, they can get meleeed down quickly. And the important thing to remember about that melee damage is it's not actually physical damage, it's shadow damage, so less things actually defend from it. Now, of course, if it goes on a rogue, they can just cloak the shadows, but other people in the group might not have enough personals to deal with that. Yeah, we saw them, uh, one of the maggots here is being stepped on the side. Now those maggots also have one very, very deadly ability. They will target a random player and will start casting a, a cone, pretty much a poison cone, that you need to interrupt. You can only interrupt it with stunts or uh, knockbacks. Now we see this huge pull once again coming out of Method and They're going to be pulling the other half of Kragma's room with this reaping. Once again, pulling about 30 mobs together to let that unholy DK pop off. The way this works out so well for them is that what they do is because of that exponential damage, by the time the reaping mobs are dead, the rest of the trash pack is at 20%. They're abusing that exponential damage from the Unholy Decay. However, this pull is still dangerous. They need to make sure that they're getting all of their interrupts and CC off on the important targets. You see that fetid maggot getting its rotten bile cast off. They need to make sure they're stunning that so nobody gets broken by any frontal AoE. Yeah, but just, we do see the um, the Blood Swarmer actually getting CC'd, getting stepped, so we don't have this fixed state on top of all this other damage that we see going out here. I think uh, one of the maggots didn't actually get interrupted immediately, so we uh, saw one of those cones going through and people dropping really low. This is actually incredibly dangerous because you have to remember this is a Sanguine Dungeon and JB does go down. He did go down at this exact same point yesterday, so we'll have to see if they're able to put together the pull. Fortunately, they have a DK for a battle res available in the group, which is something you don't have when you're running the double rogue monk group. This is just one of the one of the benefits to having a DK in this dungeon. The mobs that they have left aren't nearly as dangerous. The tank can just kite them around. And because they were able to get JB back up, they're going to pull that last Blood Swarmer into the group. I think they, they pulled that Blood Swarmer with the group yesterday, and not pulling it this time was definitely a change they've made just to be a lot more safe. Yeah, so the way they go through this Kragma room was very efficient by them. So they went to the left side first, where uh, behind the boss, there's actually the most amount of Blood Swarmers. And we did say that the Blood Swarmers are probably the most dangerous uh, mobs in this group because they can't really interrupt their difficult, their uh, abilities, they can't do anything about it, it's just a fixate that pretty much starts killing the melees. So they did go to the left side, they killed most of the Blood Swarmers first, and then did this huge pull just abusing this DK damage. And once again, like you said, abusing the DK damage, pulling the 60% reaping wave into the boss so that the DK can use all of that AoE to put Fester might strength damage into the boss. Now, talking about Kragma's abilities, he has two major abilities in phase one that he used. He'll do a frontal's 
AoE that we saw nerf take to the face right there, because it casts on the tank. And then also Kragma will occasionally choose someone in the group and charge towards their location. At the beginning of the fight, this is really important to deal with, because if the boss charges towards where they left Sanguine from the trash pack, the boss can heal for 10-15%. Definitely. Now we see, uh, whenever Kragma does any of those abilities, either the frontal tank ability or the charge or the tantrum, he will leave behind those pools on the floor that you need to soak. So you need to walk into them. If you don't walk into them fast enough, then the maggots will spawn out of it and they will uh, attack anyone who has aggro on them and leave behind a really dangerous bleed diva. Yeah, so you can see the tell of a good team making sure they get all of the bloods, blood ticks done. They do have one, but one isn't necessarily going to cause too many problems in the group. One thing we also didn't mention is that Tantrum does do massive AoE damage to the group. Generally speaking, they're planning forward for that. There's going to be two or three of them throughout the fight, so they'll probably use a rotation such as personal cool, personal damage roosting cooldowns on the first one. The healer will, will use his cooldown to do more healing on the second. And on the third one, they'll use pretty much whatever they have left to live through. Yeah, so he's just going to repeat this, uh, these phases now uh, in the normal phase where he does the charge and the frontal and then he will continue to do the tantrum again. Now we see on the other side on Team Paluka, unfortunately th this one wipe on the boss put them very, very far behind. Now they're trying to recover, they did kill the first boss in the meantime, but they do have nine deaths. They are not even in Krogmo's room yet, so there's so much uh, they need to uh, catch up on. The thing to remember is that these teams are able to watch the feed at home, albeit with a pretty significant delay. So Team Method is going to know that Team Poluka is, is struggling in this dungeon, so they might opt to pull a little bit safer throughout the rest of the dungeon because of that. We'll have to see what they plan on doing. Yeah, so Method and A, we saw struggles a bit in earlier dungeons where they maybe did a little bit too risky pulls or they had one mistake that cost them so much. So we, we saw Method and A today at least do some uh, pulls that were a little bit safer and maybe, as he said, just to see the Blood Swarmer instead of pulling it on top of this group. And it's working out for them so far. They haven't really done have any mistakes except this one death from JB coming in. And of course, the most dangerous part of the fight here is going to be when this third tantrum goes off. They don't really have anything up for this other than maybe Hellstones or Healing Potions. Fortunately, the boss is at 3 or 4%, so even if they do get a couple of deaths, looking at how low they dipped there, they were going to be perfectly fine. And the boss goes down. Yeah, so they're 62% trash. They are 18% uh, off the next Reaping Wave still, but they're going to go towards the third boss here. They are, are shrouding around this Worm here that you see is not spawned yet, but you can see this cloud on the floor. If you go too close to them, the Worm will spawn out of the ground and you have to deal with it. Now, those Worms usually are not very efficient to kill because they don't move. So you need to uh, either pull other trash on top of them or we just skip them as we see here. We see them do another relatively decently sized pull here, but there's only two mobs in this group that you really need to interrupt. You have the Bloodsworn Defiler that you need to keep on lockdown, as well as the Fallen Guardian that will occasionally buff one of his minions to do more damage. As long as you stun that, it won't really do too much damage to the tank, and they deal with it perfectly. Yeah, that was a really good pull by them. They did kill all the mobs at the same time and were already walking towards the next pull while they were dying. So we can see them actually walking past the boss for now. Maybe they're either waiting for Bloodlust or for other cooldowns to come up. Now they're pulling some of the uh, one of the corruptors. Now those faceless corruptors, they do have some scary abilities and they also have a lot of HP. Now this corruptor does uh, spawns those tentacles as we can see around it. After a couple of seconds, they will swing and do a lot of damage. And on top of that, they also have a frontal that if you get hit by it, it will fear you and do a lot of damage. Right, this is a little bit more dangerous than the pull they just did, although it has pretty much the exact same mobs. One of the skeleton groups with the stun ability that we mentioned before, on top of the abilities you dealt with with the Corruptor. Shakib going down, unfortunately, here. We'll have to see if they use their battle res on him, and they do. So no more battle reses for the rest of the dungeon for Method and A, barring any extreme time changes. But that, like we said, that pull is a little more dangerous than the previous one. If you get hit by any of the mechanics there, they almost one-shot you. Yeah, especially because they're, they're pretty much running a full melee setup, right? And those tentacles from those Corruptors, they're just so annoying. So usually what you want to do, because they spawn close to players, so what you want to do if you pull the Corruptors on top of other mobs, you want to, uh, once the tentacles are spawned, you want to drag the mobs away from the tentacles, uh, because else just the, all the melee have to walk away from the tentacles not being able to do any damage. And once again, we see here, this is the reason I love watching this trash so much. They prop this 80% Reaping Wave. They're going to pull it right up into the third boss. And once again, every single boss so far, they pulled Reaping into the boss, abusing the Unholy DK funnel into single target on top of the Outlaw Rogue's single target damage when they're able to Blade Flurry a bunch of mobs as well. Yeah, this is just so efficient by them. They even pulled those two Defilers uh, in front of the boss on top of this. Now, this is a difficult pull because not only do you have all the Reaping to deal with, all those pools underground that you need to dodge, but there's also orbs coming in that you need to dodge 
at the very same time while dealing with this upheaval that you can see. Now, uh, how this boss works is there's mushrooms that spawn around the room, right? And if you get hit, if you walk into a mushroom, you will uh, get an explosion around you and you also receive a disease debuff that stacks that does ticking damage. Now, when the boss casts his AoE, uh, the, the rest uh, of the mushrooms that are still there will explode on the whole group and depending on how many mushrooms they will stack up and do a lot of damage. Now, fortunately, this group doesn't have a lot of ways to deal with these mushrooms. They have two poison dispels in the, in the monk and in the uh, druid, and on top of that, they have the rose cloak of shadows to be able to move all everything. Okay, so it's actually a disease, so, so. Uh, only the monk can dispel it, but sure. that should be good enough because usually one player can just pick up a lot of them, use a the defensive, and then you can dispel it. So all of the divas just go away for, at once. And as you said, of course, the cloak coming in as well, and the AMS, so they have a lot of ways to deal with it. Now, they did manage to kill the trash and the reaping, now they only have the boss left. Of course, the defilers that they pulled on top also need a lot of interrupts, so very well, con very good control by them here. And we see, uh, we see as well how far ahead in the dungeon they are. They're lower on the third boss than Team Poluka is on the second the boss, in addition to being one reaping wave ahead. So it looks like that one wipe from Team Poluka is putting them very far behind. But there is room in this dungeon for another big wipe for Method and A. So it's not like Team Poluka is completely out of it yet, but it would require something pretty catastrophic for Method and A for them to get back in. Most definitely. But the last boss is quite difficult too. Uh, as I said, it is a tyrannical setting, right? So anything can happen on these bosses, and uh, they are out of battle races. So if anyone dies here, they're not able to get them back up. And especially uh, on those bosses, if you die on the very last percentage, you just lose so much time because uh, the bosses have so much HP. So if you die on the very last percentage, you can't just engage them on low percent, right? They heal back up to 100% uh, HP. You need to walk back and engage them again, losing so much time. Yeah, and once again, all they need to do ma is make sure is that they clear all of the mushrooms up before the boss does his next cast at 100 energy, and it looks like they're already almost already cleared the room before the upheaval went out, clearing the rest of the mushrooms. They have no mushrooms left after this boss frontal hits. Very clean run from them. This boss should be pretty easy after this point. Yeah, very well played, but then we also see JB, of course, uh, do as much damage as possible in that platform with the Feral Affinity. Now, uh, the boss is going down. Now, at this point, they only have 9% trash to kill. They do have to trigger the Reaping to be able to access the last boss you need to kill 100 trash to actually reach the last boss so in some other dungeons we see them skip the last reaping wave but it's not possible here in underrat and of course we see them moving on after killing the third boss they only have nine percent more trash to proc their last reaping wave and then of course they'll move on to the final boss where once again they'll plan on pulling the fifth reaping wave into the boss they're going to be pulling three corruptors into one of the heads here and they need to make sure that they lock down that one head yeah so they actually pulled one head in the back, which I'm not sure if that was a mistake because now they have two heads active. They're just going to CC it. They'll yeah, that, that will work, point. true. Yeah, that will work. They can just uh, get out of combat with it afterwards. But yeah, as you said, they were pulling three corruptors on top of this warp. Now, this is scary because, as I said, like the warp does not move. It's stationary. While the tentacles just spawn around them, dealing so much damage if you get hit by them. While the warp actually needs to be interrupted because uh, it constantly casts uh, an ability that if it goes through, it hits the whole group for a magic debuff that does initial damage and also leaves behind a dot that ticks for a lot. But we saw, of course, all the interrupts uh, were successful and none of the, the cast went through. The important thing to mention is that they have a lot of get-out-of-jail-free cards here. If they get really bad targeted maddening gaze cast, they can knock them back through both the Ring of Peace and, and JB's knockback too. So they have plenty of ways to save themselves if they get a really, really bad set of casts. But it looks like they have any dive to use any of them so far. Yeah, so after these mobs, they will uh, get 100% trash. They will be able to access the last boss room. And how this works is that the once they... Once the players teleport down, the Reaping will actually follow them. It will teleport on top of them. And again, they will just make use of this unholy DK, just having this AOE and getting uh, the single, the faster might stacks, getting more strength for more DPS. Now, they don't have their Bloodlust ready, so this boss is going to take a while. And again, they don't have a rest. So if, they, if something happens here, it's going to cost them. Yeah, you have to expect that they're planning on playing very, very safe here, which is weird because they, they probably had the option to Shadow Meld this extra Reaping, but it, I think they're comfortable enough in this dungeon with it being one of the first dungeons they practice for time trials where they know that they, they can pull this pull off pretty consistently without having to worry about any deaths. We do see the Unholy Decay doing quite a bit of damage, not as much as you would expect from an Unholy Decay. They might have actually Shadow Melded some of the extra Reaping just to play it safer because we usually see Unholy pop, pop a little bit higher here. But once again, they know they can pull these pulls off. They've, this is one of their most practiced dungeons. Yeah, to be fair, as you mentioned, they're so far ahead at this point. Uh, at least I would have liked them to play the Reaping Wave 
by itself, right? But uh, Shakib does get more damage from the faster mine, so maybe just as you said, they just they just practice it so much, and for the extra damage that Shakib gets, they are pulling it on top, and uh, it worked out really well. They killed all the reaping so far, so now they only have the boss abilities left to deal with. Which uh, of course you see those spores spawning around them, which if you get hit by them, they will ex uh, they will explode and leave those paddles behind and also do damage. So you don't want to get hit by them, but they don't have a lot of HP, so any any AOE ability like a thunderclap or something like that will just get rid of them. And we should also mention that this boss's HP bar works a lot differently from other boss's HP bars. This boss's HP bar is actually its energy bar. Whenever you fill the boss's energy bar to 100%, he spawns two blood visages. Once you kill those blood visages, the boss takes a sixth of his health in damage, and that means you need to kill six bloods to finish the boss off. So three full energy bars, and then the boss finishes. Yeah, and uh, those blood visages, you don't even have to kill them because you, ha you have a friendly NPC here to help you out that kills it for you. Now, on the very last sets of blood visages that spawn, of course, you want to switch damage to them, but otherwise you just want to be, uh, you want to keep hitting the boss so uh, more of those blood visages spawn. So two energy bars down for Method A. They only need to make sure they fill up one more of them. They need to make sure that they're kiting around the room here, making sure they're not filling up too many of these spots with these br boss frontals. And it looks like what they're doing is they're moving the boss forward and then turning around behind him so that he, he spews out the, all of this gray goo to where it already was, so that it'll bounce even further away from them, which is pretty smart. Yeah. Pretty much positioning from there. Exactly. So they do a, he does cast his frontal where he targets a player, right? So if one player is out of position and he stands uh, on the other side of the boss, then he will uh, cover the room in, uh, pretty much with those ray pools, which not only do the damage to you if you stand in them, but also slow you, so they're very annoying to deal with. And uh, of course, one more ability from this boss is just the AoE damage, the AoE debuff that uh, the healer has to deal with. But JB has an easy job doing it as he does 10 KDPS on top of healing the group as well. Method NA with a very impressive underrod run, sealing their victory.